The following program, Search the Scriptures, is brought to you by the Highway 5 South Church of Christ in Mountain Home. Speakers are Keith Sharp and Trevor Campbell. We invite you to call or write the church to submit questions for the speakers to answer. We'll provide answers from the Bible to your questions. Trevor, does God judge some laws more strictly than others? Uh, you know, that's a good question. There, there are examples where he was more severe in punishment. All right, well, let's talk about that then. Good evening. I'm Keith Sharp. You're watching Search the Scriptures. My partner on the program is Trevor Campbell. Trevor, please introduce yourself and the brethren in Piatt. Sure, yeah. My name is Trevor Campbell. I do worship and preach over in Piatt with the Church of Christ that meets there on Highway 62 on the north side of the highway. And we meet on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. for a Bible class. It's an open discussion of the Bible. And then 10.45 a.m. is a worship service. If you're in Marion County or around the Piatt area, come on out and join us on Sunday mornings. If you have a question for me, 870-435-2737 is the number there on the screen. You can call me there if you have a question for the program or you just want to talk some Bible with me, feel free to give me a call there. And of course, my name is Keith Sharp and I preach at the Highway 5 South Church of Christ in Mountain Home. We meet one mile south of the Highway 62 412 bypass on the way down to Salesville. If you'll turn to the south off of Highway 62 412 onto Highway 5, and, and as you're traveling to the southeast, you'll pass first on your right, Good Samaritan. Then if you look on your left, you'll see the sign for the Highway 5 South Church of Christ. We have Bible classes for all ages at 10 o'clock on Sunday morning. We have our worship assembly at 11 o'clock on Sunday morning, and again at 2 o'clock on Sunday afternoon. We have a Wednesday evening uh, assembly and Bible study at 7 o'clock, and we have a ladies Bible class at 10 o'clock on Wednesday morning that all you ladies are invited to, and you'll be very benefited by that. We invite you to our services. You'll be very welcome there. We'll be doing things according to the Scriptures. Now, if you have a question for the program that you'd like to, to submit to me, now Trevor's already told you how to be in touch with him. We invite you folks over in Marion County to do that. But if you want to be in touch with me, then please call me, Keith Sharp, at 870-321-5746. Or you can email keithsharp2021 at gmail.com. Or you can write, if you prefer, to search the scriptures at Post Office Box 263 in Mountain Home, 726 Five, four. Let us know what your question is. Your questions generate the subject matter on this program. Well, we do have a question before us this evening, uh, and that question is, what laws was the Lord more severe in judgment on, and what other laws did he exercise more mercy? All right, Trevor, go ahead and tell us about that, please. All right, well, uh, you know, going through the Old Testament, you're going to find many, many instances where uh, God did punish mankind because of their sins. One of the things that I, that I find that's it's interesting is in Deuteronomy chapter 22 is one of those cases where God in the law um, delves out the punishment or tells the people uh, how to punish an individual when they've committed uh, certain sins. And in Deuteronomy 22, there's two sins I would like to look at. Actually, it's one sin, and that's the sin of fornication. But in the first instance we're going to look at, one deals with adultery, and the other deals with just fornication. So these are both sins. Um, in Matthew chapter 15, Jesus denounced both of these, saying that adultery and also fornication defile an individual. They're, they're sin to an individual. But in Deuteronomy chapter 22, when God gave the law to the people through Moses here, uh, he gives punishments for adultery, and he gives punishment for fornication. We're going to see one is, is really much more severe. And in beginning in verse 22, it says, If a man is found lying with a woman, married to a husband, then both of them shall die, the man that lay with the woman and the woman, so you shall put away the evil from Israel. Now, that reference there, to put away the evil there, is to stop the evil influence and to keep it from spreading because sin is contagious. And then in 23, if a young woman who is a virgin is betrothed to a husband and a man finds her in the city and lies with her, then you shall bring them both out to the gate of the city and you shall stone them to death with stones. The young woman, because she did not cry out in the city, and the man, because he humbled his neighbor's wife, so you shall put away the evil from among you. 
All right. So this is the law concerning adultery. They carried with it the death penalty. Then if you come down a little further, he's now going to talk about the same sin, a fornication, but it's between individuals that are unmarried. So in verse 28, he says, if a man finds a young woman who is a virgin, who is not betrothed, so she has no husband, she's not married, and he seizes her and lies with her, and they are found out, then the man who lay with her shall give to the young woman's father 50 shekels of silver, and she shall be his wife, because he has humbled her. He shall not be permitted to divorce her all the days of his life. So the sin of fornication is found in both instances there. But with adultery, it was punishable with death. And in the other case where the two were unmarried, then the man would pay the bride price and this woman would become his wife. Um, you know, one of the things I think the Bible teaches and we, and we see very clearly is that God wants to put the stop to, to evil influence. In the first example with adultery, and I'm saying all this because it's like, well, why, is one, uh, why does one have the death penalty and not the other? Um, the reason I think it's more severe is because of the contagiousness and the ramifications of the sin. So, for instance, with adultery, in the first case, uh, the ramifications are much greater. The, the impact on society is much greater. When someone commits adultery, uh, it, it, it brings about a broken home. It brings about uh, a lot of pain and a lot of hurt, as well as jealousy, hatred, anger. Uh, and, and it, and it you know, can, can very much um, have, a, have a much greater effect, is what I'm trying to say, uh, on society. If you, I know a number of friends and family members of mine have had their spouses un, be unfaithful to them. And it, it just, it's just a, it's a home-wrecking situation. It's awful. But also what I have noticed, too, is that the children within the families, and some of these were godly homes. These were, these were members of the Lord's church that, that committed these sins. These children end up becoming very rebellious. And one will side with one parent over the other. And I know a number of, of these children now have grown up that, that were friends of mine. And they, they're not members of the church. They're not obedient to God. And, and they're rebellious against God. And so it, it caused all that. And so God was putting, putting a, a, an end to that by putting these individuals to death. Um, again, this has much more impact on the society, the sin of, a, of adultery. Imagine if we carried, if our, if our laws you know, were like this, and, uh, you know, and, and it carried with it the death penalty, adultery. You know, God wanted to put a stop to it so their society wouldn't look like, unfortunately, the way ours looks today with so many broken homes. The second sin is still fornication, uh, but it, it, it carries with it. It's not near the impact, if you will, on families or society. And so what God has the man do is the honorable thing. He pays the bride price and he marries the woman because they committed fornication. So I think the impact, um, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, there's an example concerning the church where Paul told the Corinthians that they had a man there who was committing adultery and Paul said he needs to be put away from among you, put out of the church because Paul said a little leaven leavens the whole lump. He's talking about the evil influence. If you allow one person to do this and you act like everything's fine and okay, others will start to do that and now you've got all these broken homes and you've got this mess within the church that God never intended for mankind and certainly not for his church. So even in that text of 1 Corinthians chapter 5 concerning the man who was committing adultery that was a member of the, of the church there in Corinth, he said you must put away the evil from among yourselves. And Paul was quoting these types of text right here and that's to stop the evil influence. So there are cases where God was more severe as far as the punishment on mankind. But I think also when we take a look at it, there's, there's a reason for it. Uh, because of the impact it would have had on their communities. All right, Keith, I'll, I'll kick it over to you. That's just an example there. Okay, Trevor. I'm going to take a slightly different approach. And it's not to disagree with what Trevor said. Uh, because he demonstrated there in the Old Testament the difference between the punishment for fornication and the punishment for adultery. In Romans chapter 6, verse 23, uh, the Apostle Paul says, For the wages of sin is death. Trevor, you're going to have to take it. I've got something in my throat. Oh, okay. I wonder, <laughs> Sorry I, about that. I wasn't sure where you were going there. Um. <clears throat> well, that's all right. I'll take it back. I had to clear okay. my throat. <laughs> Forgive me. Romans chapter 6, verse 23. For the wages of sin is death but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The result of all sin is death. Now, the death here, of course, is spiritual death, separation from God. That's shown by the law of contrast uh, 
in the passage. The wages of sin is death. Now the opposite of that is the gift of God is eternal life. And, and so the death is eternal death just as the life is eternal life. And so wages are what we earn, what we deserve. A gift is something that is freely given, freely bestowed. We don't earn it. God gives us a gift in Jesus Christ our Lord, and that gift is eternal life. Sin brings its wages, what we earn, what we deserve, and those wages are death. That's true of any sin. Any sin separates us from God. And unless we repent of it, it will cause us to be lost. Now, of course, under the civil law of the Old Testament, various sins had different punishments because that's a matter of simple justice. But sin separates from God. Now, I do believe that we can make this distinction scripturally. Uh, and I want to be very careful about this. There is a difference between a sin that we commit in ignorance or human weakness and a sin committed in outright rebellion against God. And that's, that's demonstrated both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. For sake of time, I'm just going to look at the New Testament. In Acts chapter 8, there was a man by the name of Simon. He had been a sorcerer, but had become a disciple of Christ. Uh, and uh, the apostle, this is in uh, Acts chapter 8, and it was taking place uh, in Samaria. Uh, and the apostles came down from Jerusalem and imparted to the Samaritans the uh, gift of the Holy Spirit, uh, the miraculous powers of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and Simon, who had been a sorcerer, wanted to buy that power. Now read with me Acts 8. I'm going to begin in verse uh, 22. Uh, let me see, I'll begin in verse 20 and read down through verse 23. But Peter said to him, Your money perish with you because you thought the gift of God could be purchased with money. That was a sin of ignorance. Simon thought he could purchase that gift, but he couldn't do it. And so he sinned in ignorance. You have neither part nor lot in this matter, for your heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent therefore of this your wickedness, and pray God if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity. And Simon was held as guilty, and he had to repent and pray for forgiveness. But that sin of ignorance or weakness could be forgiven. Now on the other hand, there's a sin of high-handed rebellion where somebody doesn't care what God's Word says, doesn't care what God says, and refuses to repent of that sin. That sin will certainly lead to eternal death. An example of this is in Hebrews chapter 10, beginning in verse 26, after he's uh, exhorted us to not forsake the assembling of ourselves together, he says, beginning in verse 26, For if we sin willfully, now that's present tense for means go on sinning willfully. This is someone who will not repent. If we sin willfully, after we've received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin. Now that, that by the way, is based on Old Testament law. Under the Old Testament, in Leviticus chapters 4 and 5, a sin of ignorance, the person was still guilty, but they could bring the sacrifice. But Numbers chapter 15, a sin of high-headed rebellion, there was no forgiveness. That person was to be cut off from Israel if he was stubborn, a high-headed rebellion. Example of a high-headed rebellion sin is Saul, King Saul, in 1 Samuel chapter 15. Uh, and, and he was accused by Samuel of sinning presumptuously. That's a sin of high-headed rebellion. When he refused to put to death King Agag, and when he kept alive, the best of the flocks and the herds of the Amalekites. And, and so he sinned presumptuously, high-headed rebellion. And he was not forgiven. He lost the kingdom and he lost his soul because of that sin. If we sin rebellion against God, we know what God's Word says. We don't care what God's Word says. We're going to do what we want to do. Unless we repent of that attitude, there's no forgiveness for that sin. Our, we have cut ourselves off from God eternally. And that's the point the inspired writer is making in Hebrews chapter 10. So all sin causes us to be cut off from God. Sins of ignorance and weakness, once we find we're guilty, but if we find out that we're guilty, then we need to repent, pray God, and ask for forgiveness. 
If you're sinning in high-handed rebellion, unless you repent, there's nothing can be done. Well, Trevor, I've said what I want to say about that. Uh, do you want to add anything on that question? All right, good. Well, we have another question. And that question is, it's really a very good question. Did God forsake Jesus? Trevor, tell us about that. Yeah, yeah, very good question. So while Jesus was on the cross, he did say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And I think this is going to be an interesting episode because I think Keith has an entirely opposing view to what I'm going to give. And I'm really interested actually to see what you have to say, Keith. Uh, mine, I'm going to keep it kind of brief because uh, I do want to give Keith plenty of time. I, I do want to hear what he has to say. Um, in, the, in that uh, statement on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I don't believe the Bible teaches that God forsake, the Father forsook Jesus Christ. And I'll give you what I believe is the evidence or some of the evidence for that. Um, first of all, the, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ was, was the ultimate sacrifice. When we look back through the history of the Old Testament, there were all these sacrifices. And if you go back even to Genesis chapter 8, you will see Noah offering burnt offerings and sacrifices to God, and the Lord smelled a soothing aroma, a sweet-smelling aroma. The same was true in the, in the old law. In Exodus 29, God gave them instructions for burnt offerings, and then he said, I will smell a, a soothing aroma. Well, all of those offerings, you know, God did not forsake or turn his back on his people when they offered those things to him. And in Ephesians chapter 5, in verse 2, it says, and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. Well, those Old Testament sacrifices were, were a foreshadowed the, the sacrifice of Christ, which came in the first century there. And so those sacrifices, God smelled a sweet-smelling aroma. With the offering of Christ, again, he smelled a, a sweet-smelling aroma. Uh, to me, there's nothing there to, to suggest that God would turn his back on that offering. But there are other texts. In John chapter 8, in John chapter 8, verse 29, Jesus said to his, his disciples here in verse 29, he says, and he who sent me is with me. The Father has not left me alone, for I always do those things that please him. So God the Father is with Christ, he says, because I do the things that please him. And again, in 5.2 there of Galatians, he offered up a sacrifice that was pleasing to God. Uh, in John chapter 16, just before Jesus' arrest, in John chapter 16 and verse 32, Jesus said, indeed the hour is coming, yes, has now come, that you will be scattered. His apostles were going to leave him, each to his own, and will leave me alone. And yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. So Jesus, again, because he's pleasing to the Father, he's doing the will of the Father, he says, you apostles are going to leave me, you're going to scatter, but, but I'm not alone. The, the Father is with me. But we do have that statement in, uh, on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That is a, a, a direct quote from the first verse of this 22nd Psalm, Psalm 22, is where it says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That was a Psalm of David. Um, and if you look at the, the Psalms and the nature of the Psalms, I think it's of the utmost importance to understand the Psalms. They were for teaching and admonishing. And they're a teaching tool. You know, when you look at the 22nd Psalm, David says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then in the 23rd Psalm, which is a, a very well-known Psalm, the Lord is my shepherd. You know, that's how he starts the psalm out. The Lord is my shepherd. Well, David, which is it? You know, for one, at one point you say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And the very next psalm there we have you saying that the Lord is my shepherd, that he's guarding me, watching over me, and, and protecting me, and feeding me, and with me. So, you know, which is it? Well, I think they're, they're a teaching tool. In the 22nd Psalm, if you read it its entirety, I believe Je Jesus is referencing that psalm on the cross because it contains a number of references and prophecies of him and of his time on the cross and his persecution. But if you read the entirety of the psalm, it later on in verse 24 says that God has not forsaken him. It says that God has not hidden his face from him, uh, more specifically, not hidden his face from him, nor has he abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. And so in the psalm itself, David at first says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But then, and more of the conclusion of the psalm, is that he is not forsaken. He does something similar. Uh, the psalmist in Psalm 13 does something very similar. The psalm starts out, How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? 
But then the conclusion in verse 6 of the psalm is that God has dealt bountifully with me. So I believe these are human emotions that we're seeing in the psalms. David is a man. Uh, he's an inspired man for sure, but these are human emotions. Um, in one part, point, we feel like we're forsaken, and then when we calm down and come to our senses, we realize that God has blessed us and dealt bountifully with us. Well, I don't want to take any more time up, Keith. I'll just kind of conclude real quickly with this. I believe what the Bible teaches is that the Father was with the Son. Jesus said just before his death, the Father has not left me alone. Um, and, and I believe what he's doing there on the cross is simply referencing that 22nd Psalm, which, which again, has and contains a number of references and prophecies about him. Trevor, let me pick up with your last statement that he was oh. referencing the 22nd Psalm. That's right. But when an Old Testament passage is referenced in the New Testament, it's being fulfilled. All of the predictions of Psalm 22 were fulfilled in Jesus. Now, the latter part of that psalm, where he recognizes that God is with him, is the prophecy of his resurrection from the dead. And so he was raised from the dead. But they could, he could tell all his bones. That's a prophecy that was fulfilled. Uh, they uh, went around and, and uh, said, ridiculed him on the cross. That's a prophecy that was fulfilled. Every bit of that psalm was fulfilled in Jesus on the cross and in the resurrection. If I say, Trevor, why did you hit me? I'm accusing you of hitting me. That, that's implied. When Jesus said, why have you forsaken me? He was accusing the Father of forsaking him. If the Father didn't forsake the Son, then the Son falsely accused the Father. He would have been doing the same thing that Job did when he accused God of mistreating him. And God called him to account for that. Now, Job's friends were wrong in the accusations they made about Job. But God called Job, even though Job was going through horrible suffering, God was not mistreating him. Of course, we know it was the Satan doing that. And Job was wrong and had to offer a sacrifice to God for accusing God of mistreating him. Yes, Jesus was suffering terribly, but if he falsely accused the Father forsaking him, then he sinned against God, and that was not a sinless sacrifice. The, the significance of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ is that no other sacrifice could take away our sins, and we certainly agree on that. The blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sin, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 4. And by the way, Psalm 22 is not the only place that prophesies this. Isaiah 53 prophesies it as well. I want to read Isaiah chapter 53, verses 4 through 6, which is parallel. Surely He has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteem Him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Now that doesn't mean that God judged Jesus as a guilty sinner. It means that Jesus bore the penalty for our sins. The penalty for our sins is separation from God. Jesus was separated from God. By the way, the Old Testament says that God will not forsake those who are faithful to Him. The ones that God forsakes are those who forsake God. And so in forsaking His Son, God treated Jesus as a guilty sinner. He wasn't guilty. He was bearing the penalty for our sins. And by doing that, He atoned for our sins. He bore the penalty. In fact, Paul shows this in Romans chapter 3, that the sacrifice of Christ is a justification of the justice of God. In Romans chapter 3, I'm going to begin in, uh, for sake of time, uh, verse 23, uh, being, for all, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation, a satisfaction. is satisfied 
God's demand for justice. God is holy. God is just. Sin must be punished. The punishment for sin is separation from God. Jesus was separated, from, though He did no wrong. He, but He was separated from God, so He bore the penalty for our sins. Whom God set forth as a propitiation through His blood, through faith, to demonstrate His righteousness. The sacrifice of Christ demonstrates that God is righteous, though He forgives our sins, because there's been a penalty paid for our sins. And that penalty is not just a physical death, that penalty is a spiritual death. That satisfied God's demand for justice. The sinner's uh, uh, demand, the sinner should die for his sins, not just physically, but spiritually. And so Jesus died spiritually, not just physically. The Father turned his back on the Son. He forsook the Son. That's why Jesus said, uh, as recorded both in Matthew and in Mark, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? All of Psalm 22 was fulfilled in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. All of Isaiah 53 was fulfilled in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. Psalm 22 foretells that God would forsake him. Isaiah 53 foretells that he bore the penalty for our sins. And remember, the penalty for sins is not physical death, it's spiritual death. He died spiritually. He suffered the penalty for our sins. It's because of that that we have the hope of life eternal in Him. Well, Trevor, we could both say a lot more on that, but I've finished what I wanted to say. I'm going to turn it back over to you. Oh, oh well, I wanted to give you plenty of time. I, um, I'm not sure where to go from there. You know, uh, I was considering all the things you had to say there, and, and it, you know, it's going to give me some things to think about for sure, and I was trying to follow your, your line of thought there. Um, you know, in the 22nd Psalm, uh, you said uh, later on there, when it talks about in verse 24, he's not despised uh, nor abhorred the affliction of the affliction, hasn't hid his, hidden his face from him. You said that has to do with the resurrection? Is that right. Correct? That, that's, a, okay. that's a prophecy of his resurrection. Okay, okay. I'll have to, I'll have to consider that. Um, you know, one, one of the things that I noted in the Psalms, and this is something anybody can see, you just go through the Psalms, is so many of them start out with kind of, a, kind of this type of language, some kind of a cry. Um, oh Lord, or oh, oh my God, or, or something like that. God's name, or the name Lord, appears in many of the first verse uh, of the Psalms, if you kind of go through them. Um, so he's crying out for sure. Um, but uh, I, I, like I say, I'm just going to have to think about some of the things you've presented. Um, what I still see in the, in the text, and Hebrews 13 makes note of this, is those who please God are, are not forsaken by him. And so when I look at Jesus Christ, I still see, I'm still seeing, and like I say, I could change, but I'm still seeing that he is just simply referencing the psalm. So they would come to this psalm, or this psalm would come to mind, where they would see that truly there are a number of fulfillments concerning him here uh, when he's on the cross. But the conclusion is still that he was not forsaken, and the fact that he says he hadn't his, hidden his face from him. But anyway, like I say, I'll have to... I'll have to think about what you said there. I appreciate your thoughts. But if anybody has, you know, uh, further questions about this or wants to discuss this more, you know, feel free to submit another question about it. And, of course, feel free to submit any questions concerning the Bible to us. We, we, we enjoy studying these things out and, and uh, giving you our thoughts on uh, Bible-based. Hopefully you're seeing that, thoughts on these passages and these questions. So we hope you'll watch with us next week. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for watching Search the Scriptures. If you have a Bible question or comment, you may call 870-321-5746, email keithsharp2021 at gmail.com, or write Keith Sharp at P.O. Box 263, Mountain Home, Arkansas, 72654, and your question will be answered on the air. Be sure to watch next week at the same time for another edition of Search the Scriptures. Until then... The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.